Right, so it's a pleasure to have our first speaker this morning, Joel Groman. Uh, the later part of the title will be Symplectic Cohomology of Non-Exact Embeddings and SYZ, but I believe this starts with an overview of a local Fleur program first. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so, so thanks, uh, Denis, thanks, uh, and the organizers for inviting me. Yeah, and so, yeah, so the actual title is not written here. Uh, so this is somehow an alternative description of what uh, this title is about. So yeah, so, so, there's, uh, so basically I want to uh, uh, advertise this subject of local flirt, local flirt theory. I think there haven't been a lot of talks about it. Uh, so this is kind of a program which uh, it has like uh, the homo homo homology level story of it in connection with SYZ something that uh, Umut and I have been developing for like two years now. And then there's a, this embeds inside a bigger program with uh, uh, Mohammed, which uh, is about the chain level theory. But today I want to somehow uh, talk about how uh, the story of classical mirror symmetry uh, and, uh, how, uh, and how it relates to uh, homology level local theory. So I will start by somehow, okay, so let's say we have an, SYZ federation. Um, okay, so I've written here a lot of bullet points, so maybe ignore them or if you want to read them, but I'll say out loud like two points to uh, remember. So uh, the family FLIR program, uh, basically the way it works, uh, you start with an SYZ federation, then you construct a mirror by constructing uh, the points of the mirror. That's what, uh, and then you impose a smooth structure. By contrast, uh, the local FLIR program, which I will be discussing at length, uh, starts by constructing open sets. So the open sets, they come automatically with, with, uh, with a smooth structure. And that has some advantages, for example, uh, when talking about um, singular fibers. Um, that's one thing. So this contrast between points versus open sets. Uh, the other thing is that Somehow, the, um, uh, when, you, when you work with local FLIR theory, uh, the stage at which you have to start talking about Lagrangian intersection theoremology occurs much later, namely when you want to, when you want to talk about homological mirror symmetry. But if you just want to say, construct the mirror, and I will argue, if you want to prove uh, classical mirror symmetry, then you can do this entirely within Hamiltonian theoremology. So this, is, that's, this has a great advantage because, well, Hamiltonian theoremology involves a lot less machinery than, uh, like basically the, the, the machinery that, that is necessary has been developed already in the early 90s. Um, so, so, so these are the two points that uh, somehow that we emphasize open sets versus neighborhoods and that we somehow, as long as we're talking only about classical neurosymmetry, we will be uh, entirely within uh, closed string Hamiltonian FLIR mode. And somehow to make this point, I will just give some kind of friendly challenge. Um, and the challenge is, well, uh, if you construct, you, you use family FLIR theory to construct a mirror, uh, then this mirror presumably satisfies some version of classical mirror symmetry. Maybe I haven't said it, but classical mirror symmetry says that there's some kind of relation uh, between quantum cohomology and gromov witten invariance on M and uh, Hodge theory um, uh, period integrals on uh, the mirror and check. So I'm asking just a very simple question. Is it possible to prove uh, from the construction of the uh, family for the mirror that uh, the mirror satisfies some kind of topological test of mirror symmetry? The topological test of mirror symmetry is that uh, uh, somehow the, the claim of, uh, uh, so basically what it says is that um, uh, the, the, that if you have a mirror, if you have M, then, the, then it, uh, it, it has like a, a Hodge diamond and then uh, M check, the, the Hodge diamond of M check is given by flipping around uh, this axis. So is there a way of seeing this without, I, of course I understand that one can prove, like I think the idea, like the, in what Konsevich originally envisioned was 
uh, start by proving homological mirror symmetry and then reinterpret Hodge theoretic invariance in terms categorically and then uh, deduce uh, Hodge theoretic or classical mirror symmetry from, uh, from, from homological mirror symmetry. But I'm asking like, I have like this very basic question about the topological test. Is there a way of doing it without relying on a homological mirror symmetry? So this is something to keep in mind and hopefully, uh, hopefully I will get to the end of my talk before this hour ends and then I will have something to say about this from the point of view of the local Fleur program. Okay, so let, let me start by giving some background on, like it's all about Hamiltonian Fleur homology, so let me remind uh, everyone what, what uh, Hamiltonian Fleur homology is. So we start with a, a symplectic manifold, uh, which is either compact or geometrically bounded. So this, I don't want to repeat the definition, but this is kind of like geometrically boundedness is kind of a completeness condition. So for example, something which is not bounded uh, is if you take C and you remove a point, that is not geometrically bounded. Um, so it's kind of a completeness condition. So without geometric boundedness, you have very little, there's very, very little to say about, it's like, it's like, like you, the way you need completeness in Riemannian geometry. So th this, this is the, uh, the manifold. Then uh, suppose we have some function, which some smooth function, which is proper and bounded below. So this is a Hamiltonian. And I wrote here a function on M, but generally one should think of not just a function M times like a, uh, uh, S1, so some kind of time period, uh, time independent Hamiltonian, but it doesn't matter for today's talk. So, uh, so Hamiltonian Fleur homology associates with each such uh, thing, with each Hamiltonian, uh, a group uh, called the Hamiltonian Fleur homology, so, uh, which is graded. Uh, and you think of it, it's a complex, which is generated by, by one periodic orbits of H. And it has a differential, which is given by counting Fleur trajectories, which are cylinders uh, connecting these periodic orbits and satisfying a certain um, uh, PDE. And what this object is, well, it's, uh, it's a non-Archimedean normed space uh, over uh, the Novikov ring. So what the Novikov ring is, well, this is the, uh, all, kind, all formal sums where we allow arbitrary powers, arbitrary real powers, um, subject to the condition that the, uh, that, uh, the, the uh, lambda i goes to infinity, and then coefficients are in some ring. It, for today's talk, all the, in all, we, can't, we can take these coefficients to be in z. Um, so, uh, so this is, and what it is, it's a, it's a normed space. It's very important, this thing that it has a norm. So let me describe what, it, how, uh, what is the norm. So the norm is, well, given, uh, so we said that it's, it comes from a complex which is generated by periodic orbits. So if we have a, a, a periodic orbit uh, gamma, um, like at the level of complex, like at the, at the, this, this is a description of the norm of the level of the chain complex. Uh, so at, uh, because of course, when you do homology, you're taking a quotient and then, um, yeah, maybe I should say semi-normed because then you do some kind of indu something induced and it could be semi-normed. But anyhow, at the but, but this kind of thing about like this uh, possibility that will be a semi-norm does not uh, play any role, like does not occur for any of the examples we discussed today. Uh, anyhow, um, uh, so, so the, uh, the norm at the level of the chain complex is like we have a periodic orbit and we multiply it by some element of the Novikov ring then uh, the norm is e to the minus lambda i times e to the, this thing is, is the action functional. So it has a symplectic area term and has like a Hamiltonian term. Uh, so so what, what you should remember is that the larger we make lambda, the smaller we make the norm. Uh, the larger the value of the Hamiltonian along the periodic orbit, again, the smaller the norm. But then there's this, this term, which I'm not really explaining, uh, this is, has something to do with the length of the periodic orbit. The longer the periodic orbit, the bigger the norm. Uh, okay, and then there's just one additional piece of structure. Uh, if we have uh, an ordered pair of, of uh, Hamiltonians, namely they're pointwise 
uh, H1 is less than or equal to H2, then this induces a map from the Hamiltonian fluoromology of H1 to the Hamiltonian fluoromology of H2, which is referred to a continuation map. This is called a continuation map. And the most important property of the continuation map is that under this monotonicity assumption, the norm does not increase. Okay, so this is Hamiltonian fluoromology. So now we can uh, go back to talk about local SH. So local symplectic homology. So, uh, so up to now, I've been talking about fluoromology associated with functions. By the way, maybe I should stop. Are there any questions about anything I said up to now? Okay, so I think I will continue. Keep going. Yes, uh, okay. So, um, so instead of functions, now let's talk about compact sets. So say we have a compact set inside M, then this induces a, a group, which I call symplectic homology associated with the embedding. So it's the symplectic homology of the embedding of K inside M, which you can think of it a, a bit informally, actually, but this can actually be made rigorous as fluoromology of the Hamiltonian, which is not a smooth Hamiltonian, but rather a generalized function, which is the characteristic function of K. So the characteristic function of K is the function which is zero on K and then uh, infinity everywhere away from K. Uh, and the way this is implemented is by some procedure called the completed co-limit, which I will not go into details how this is done, but morally this kills the generators in the complex which occur away from K. I will, I will explain this a little bit further later, but recall a minute ago, I described the way I described the norm I said the value of the Hamiltonian, the larger the value, the smaller the norm. So somehow, since we're looking at something which is infinite outside, that means that it has norm zero. So it somehow uh, gets, uh, it, it, it gets killed by this completed co-limit. Uh, one can say something, so this is for arbitrary compact sets. If we talk specifically about, uh, let's talk specifically about the case where where, where if we look at the compact set K and we restrict the symplectic form omega to K, uh, then we get some, a, a Liouville domain. Namely, we can find the primitive of omega such that it's a, uh, such as that it's a Liouville domain, satisfying a technical condition, which never mind. Uh, then one can actually say, this is kind of a work in progress. One can say that actually uh, the Fleur complex associated with this, uh, with this compact set uh, is, uh, comes only from inside generators. So what do I mean by inside generators? So if you have this kind of uh, Liouville domain, this means that uh, you have a very nice, uh, the Hamiltonian flow has a very nice description of the boundary. Uh, so so what, what, what happens is, is that, uh, well, in this, in this kind of setting, you can say that there are periodic orbits which there are constant orbits, which have to do with the constant value inside. Then there are periodic orbits, which occur at this convex bend. There's this convex bend of the, of the Hamiltonian. Like, uh, so, um, so at this convex bend, maybe I didn't say this before, but like to implement this, maybe I should have, did I say this? Like to implement this thing about like Hamiltonian fluoromology of this generalized function, what we do is we approximate by some arbitrary sequence of monotone functions, which converge to zero inside, like a monotone sequence of functions converge to zero inside and to infinity outside. Anyhow, in that case, there is the bend. So the convex bend introduces certain periodic orbits. The concave bend introduces again, certain other periodic orbits, and then there are constants outside. And what I'm saying is that if if the restriction of omega to k is exact, uh, then uh, this part is all that contributes. These are the, called the inside generators. So at, as a chain complex, this, this is something, has some kind of something intrinsic. How, not as a chain complex, sorry. The generators are something which are intrinsic to k. However, um, if you are familiar with symplectic homology, maybe you've heard of this idea of a maximum principle, which says uh, that um, uh, 
somehow when you have a Liouville domain and you have a Liouville subdomain, then there's some kind of maximum principle which prevents somehow the Liouville subdomain is somehow not affected. The, the, the differential of the Liouville subdomain is not affected by the embedding uh, in, inside the bigger domain. So this does not hold in this generality. So in fact, uh, so what we should think of is as something which is generators come from K, but the differential and further operations, which we will discuss in a little while, they're all input, which comes from the manifold. You have all kinds of periodic orbits running around the entire manifold. It's not periodic, all, all kinds of FLIR trajectories running around in the, in the manifold and connecting these uh, periodic orbits. And that's why I was, this was like the original title of the talk, I was talking about non-exact, like FLIR theory for non-exact uh, embeddings of Liouville domains. Uh, and, the, and, and maybe I should say, I, I've been talking about arbitrary Liouville domains. Basically the only kind of example, almost the only kind of example will be uh, Weinstein neighborhoods of Tori. So just think about Weinstein neighborhoods of Tori for, for uh, most of the talk. Um, and then let me just say a few general features. So, uh, so the general features are, again, this thing is like a norm space over the Novikov ring. And other feature is that it defines a, there, uh, uh, there's a pre-sheaf, uh, which somehow you have the, you, you look at the growth index topology of like compact sets, uh, compact subsets of a symplectic manifold. Um, then every time you have an inclusion, there is a map going in the opposite direction called the restriction map, which, which uh, goes from the uh, local symplectic homology of the bigger set to the local symplectic homology of the smaller set. And this is a particular instance of this, uh, what, what I said before, that whenever you have an ordered set or ordered pair of Hamiltonians, there is a continuation map. Okay. Um, and one particular manifestation of this is that if you take K to be the entire manifold, you get a map from the quantum cohomology which you can think of as the local symplectic homology of the entire manifold to the local symplectic homology of this uh, subset. But actually this works even when, so for the entire manifold, this works even if the entire manifold is not compact. So, but, uh, so it's not just a particular case of this. And then uh, most importantly, this has a structure, like each of these groups has a structure of a, a BV algebra. So first of all, it means that it's like a graded commutative algebra, which carries a BV structure. Um, okay. Um, so this is the general, the general story. And the minute you hear, you hear something like it's a norm space, I said like, uh, which actually is complete. So it's a Banach space. So, so basically we have a sheaf of uh, commutative Banach spaces. And the minute you hear something like this in connection with mirror symmetry, that should make you happy because commutative Banach spaces, they give rise to spaces by a construction known as the Gelfand spectrum. Um, however, if you do this, if you just think of arbitrary compact sets, this does not really give you what you want because if you cover a symplectic manifold, by, you can co cover any manifold by balls. So you, can, you cover a symplectic manifold by small balls. Turns out that the local symplectic homology of a small ball is zero. So you can't really piece anything together if you just look at the sheaf of, of all sets. You need to look at in, within the category of all compact sets, you need to look at subsets of these compact sets, which somehow where the characteristic functions commute with each other. So that's where the story of Lagrangian torus vibrations comes in. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Yes. Uh, I'd like to know a little more about the technical condition on the boundary finite that or something. Okay, so I'll say very briefly. So if you have an, a Liouville domain, then there's some kind of, it has a differential. Um, now the differential, since we're, th uh, uh, so, so since we're talking about some kind of the chain complex is kind of a Banach space. So the differential, you can talk about the question of whether the differential has a bounded right inverse. So finite boundary depth is another way of saying differential has a bounded right inverse. Um, does that, uh, is that so, so it's sort of a function analysis 
uh, answer, which, which I like, uh, but is there some geometric interpretation of it? Uh, like in terms of, I don't know, orbits? Um, well, it, it just means It's that, okay, we, we yeah. can talk about it later. Well, first of all, it ho in all the examples that we care about, the differential is somehow zero, so it's somehow automatic. Uh, other than that, it's, it's like a property which people have studied, but uh, is there, uh, like, the only thing I can say is, like, it it's basically says, like, if, if you work, if, another way of saying this is, if you have, if you do Fleur theory over the Novi covering, so if you have some periodic orbit that gets killed, uh, how far, like, how, how far back, like, how, how much larger is the action of the, uh, is the smallest action of a periodic orbit killing it? But it's, yeah, it's like a completely, I don't think there is a geometric, it's like a completely, uh, it has to do somehow with properties of flare trajectories. Um, so I don't okay, know. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, okay. So, okay. So the most important example uh, is uh, the, the, uh, when we talk, let's revisit, like every talk in mirror symmetry has to start, the starting point of mirror symmetry is when you talk about tori. So let's talk about the case where you have uh, the cotangent bundle of a torus. Um, you look at, uh, you have this uh, torus vibration where you forget the angles and pick a convex rational polygon, uh, P, and let's denote by KP the pre image of this convex rational polygon. And then we could ask, what is the local symplectic homology of this thing? Uh, and then I give you immediately the answer. And the answer is that uh, symplectic homology uh, is. Basically you take, so I'm working over the Novikov ring. So uh, you look at Laurent series over the Novikov ring, that's in degree zero. In higher degrees, you have vector fields. So which this is basically, and then you complete. So before I do, the, I, I, I do this completion, this is just the standard answer. Anyone who's familiar has heard the first thing about symplectic homology should be familiar with this. This is, uh, and the fact that you have this, this algebra structure is, well, one way of proving it is uh, something called the Viterbo isomorphism, which identifies um, symplectic homology of a uh, cotangent bundle with uh, with uh, with the string to part with like the homology of the free loop space. Um, and you can compute for Tori. This is uh, this is not hard to compute. So so that's one way of so this is the answer if you weren't talking about if you weren't keeping track of this norm. But now we're talking about, uh, uh, so I'm saying there's some kind of compact set and there's something which is going to depend on P. So this P induces a completion. So a completion means we take certain infinite sums. Uh, so, so, uh, so we take convergent sums. And when we talk about convergence in like a non archimedean setting, we need to specify a norm. So the norm, the formula for the norm is written here. So, so, and I'm just defining it at the level of SH0. Um, think of these generators as having uh, norm zero, sorry, norm one. Uh, but so, so I'm talking only about these generators and then the norm of these generators. So if you have a monomial, uh, then the, uh, the norm of the monomial is given by this formula. And the way to think about it is, so a monomial, we will always think of a monomial as being some kind of co-vector. So say you have some co-vector in, in, in here. Uh, so that corresponds to some function and uh, a rational co-vector, of course. And then you, you take lines, which, uh, uh, which are given by, 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 by uh, which are uh, normal to this co-vector. And then you take parallel lines. And the first time, uh, and, and somehow the, the, uh, the norm is like the max, the, the, the value of the, of the function uh, this function here at the, the largest value that you can get. So it's basically the value at the point where you somehow get out. And I want you to remember this, like, like I will keep going back and forth between this thing that somehow co-vectors are the same as functions. Yeah. This is something which will be, so, so we have this norm. So in other words, so this is like saying that the symplectic homology, the zero symplectic homology at least, is given by formal sums formal Laurent series in two variables uh, such that this norm, uh, the general term of this norm goes to zero. Like in non-Archimedean geometry to say that a sum converges is, is the same thing as requiring the norm 
of the general uh, term to go to uh, zero. And this thing, the so, so this is like, there's, there's a sheaf introduced by conservative Stroibelman, which they call the canonical sheaf, though I think they work over somehow a small, I'm working over the Novi covering, they're looking at something smaller, which is just formal around series. But, uh, but anyhow, this is something, this is something which is associated to a, uh, uh, to a, um, uh, what's it called, to, 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 to a polygon. Uh, and then there's a sheet, like, like, sorry, when you have like an integral affine structure on, on a manifold, you can associate to uh, integral affine subsets, convex integral affine uh, polygons, you can, you can uh, associate uh, something which, which satisfies a condition like this. Uh, and then if you have uh, an inclusion of subsets, then from the symplectic homology point of view, the restriction map that I described before is just take a formal sum in the bigger domain, map it to the formal sum, which is, which is written in the same way in the smaller domain. It automatically converges in the smaller domain uh, um, because the smaller domain has less restrictive requirements of convergence. Uh, and then this is, uh, so this is the restriction map of symplectic homology, but this is also the restrict restriction map in, uh, uh, in the, this canonical sheaf. So there's this sheaf, uh, and uh, I hope uh, you see what its definition is. Uh, so anyhow, what we see is that the answer is we get some kind of sheaf on, on R2, which is the base of the torus federation. Uh, now, now let's talk, now let's go back uh, to talk about this uh, reconstruction, the reconstruction problem. So you can, uh, so let's take, let's just uh, uh, give a name to, uh, uh, let's, so M was, uh, was the torus, let's say M check, uh, let's call somehow the non-Archimedean two torus. So this is the, uh, you just take the uh, product of the Novikov ring minus zero with itself, and we call this M check. Then the answer that we found, this is called the non-Archimedean two torus. So the answer that we found for the, for the sheaf uh, can be described by the following way. So you, this, this, uh, uh, this space M check comes with a map to R2, which given two points, it just maps them to the valuation. Um, so, which is like minus log of the norm or log of the norm. Um, so th this is the valuation map and this is called the non-Archimedean SYZ fibration. And so you can describe Say the canonical sheaf is the same thing as pushing forward the sheaf of analytic functions on this thing by this, uh, by this non-Archimedean SYZ fibration. So there's also like a converse construction starting from, from the sheaf. So now I'm gonna call it instead of a canonical sheaf, I'm calling it SH0. You can just apply some version of spec. And in this case, it would be spec by just taking maximal ideals. Uh, and then this recovers the space. Like this spec, like this is not spec of an algebra, this is spec of a sheaf. You have a sheaf of algebras, you can apply spec uh, at the level of sheaves and, and, get, and get a space. Um, okay, and as a, uh, so, so this is how you somehow reconstruct the mirror in the simplest case, the, this, there's this closed string reconstruction of the mirror. Um, which does not mention Lagrange, like it doesn't mention any Lagrangian fleur, fleur homology or Lagrangians and bounded culture. Okay, and just a small remark is, which will play a little role later. Um, well, uh, there is a map from the cohomology of the total space, the ordinary cohomology to the symplectic cohomology. Sorry, um, I should have, so there's a map from the com. Um, this is something I should have written uh, slightly differently. So there's a map, in general, there's a map, let me write it now, in general, for, uh, there's always a map from H star of K to uh, SH star of uh, K inside M. There's always this kind of map. And, and maybe here I should write, So under the, the, this, this map from the ordinary cohomology to symplectic cohomology, the, um, 
somehow the top, like the, 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 the fundamental class of the fiber maps to this section, so, to this non-vanishing section of uh, somehow, so there is some kind of Calabi-Yau form, or this is like the dual to the Calabi-Yau form. And then the BV operator has the description as the divergence with respect to this induced volume form. So divergence is just the thing which is dual to the uh, exterior derivative. This is, okay, so th this concludes this example. Let, let me just make one more remark that whenever you have a manifold, uh, B with an integral affine structure, you can associate it with it a canonical sheaf. And the slogan is that if you apply this spec construction that we were talking about, uh, this, this reproduces the, the sem what's, what's called the semi-flat mirror. Um, uh, which I think Mark mentioned uh, yesterday. Um, and of course, but, but once you started, to, so, so we will just be referring to this canonical sheaf. Um, and uh, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying it now. So, so maybe I, I will, like, I don't want to yet, I think it's a bit too early in the talk for the break. So I want to go on to the next example, but maybe I want to pause slightly for questions. Uh, are there any questions for, uh, so far? Actually, it's not too early for the break if this is a natural time, but you can also go for a few more minutes if you, if that makes more sense. Well, it's too early in the talk, like if I break now, okay. so I want to... <laughs> You'll uh, never get there, okay. Yeah, I'll never get there. So, uh, okay, if there are no further questions. So now there's a, the, the second most important example, which is the node singularity. Like everyone in this uh, conference has to give talk about the node singularity. Um, uh, unfortunately, I will have to go over this rather quickly, but okay, but let, let's, uh, here it goes. So, so the next example is where we consider the, the case where we have a manifold M, which is given by, uh, it's a sub-manifold of C2 times a cylinder, uh, and it's given by this equation. Now this man and this manifold comes with a Lagrangian torus vibration, which is given by this formula, but let me describe it geometrically. And there are two, two, uh, two descriptions and both of them somehow, both of them are important. So one is the left Schutz vibration point of view where this is like a conic vibration. So, um, so we just have a cylinder and above a generic point, we have a cone. Uh, and then there's a special point above, over which we have a, a union of two uh, complex lines. Uh, and then uh, we have like the torus vibration, the description is, well, we have an, an S, the global S1 action, which rotates around in the fibers. And then we have like a function on the cylinder, which whose, whose uh, fibers are, are circles. And so the, the, the torus fibers are given by parallel transporting this S1, uh, these orbit, orbits of the S1 action around this fiber. This is the, the, the description on the uh, left vibration side. The description on the um, on the uh, 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 Lagrangian torus vibration is that over a generic point we have a torus. Over uh, uh, then there's this over the singular point we have like this uh, this kind of pin pinched uh, torus. So it's like a, a, a nodal singularity. And then there is an induced integral affine structure where the where uh, so the, the so. So, which is given by uh, a pair of functions. So, so, um, so uh, well, if we go back, sorry, so there were, maybe I should have fitted this into one screen. Okay, maybe now it's better. Uh, so, uh, so we have this function mu one, sorry, we have this function mu two. So mu two describes a global uh, S1 action and therefore describes a, a global uh, a integral affine coordinates. And these correspond to these straight lines. If you take the function, this one, this does not, this, the, the orbits of, of, of this one don't close off. Uh, and in fact, so if you were to look at uh, lines mu one equals constant, you would get some kind of curved lines. But in fact, there's some way of like, if you remove, if you remove a, a, a ray, then you can, uh, you can find some function, which is a function of both variables, which will give you uh, uh, straight vertical lines. And here, well, these lines, here they're drawn in such a way that, 
somehow if you do analytic continuation, uh, these lines uh, bend uh, backwards because this integral affine structure, there's no global integral affine structure, it has some kind of monotone. But still, there's an integral affine manifold, so there's a canonical sheaf, the way uh, it was described before. So what I'm going to do now, I'm, I think I'm falling, like I was not very realistic about uh, how much one can fit into one talk. Um, so I want to, I, I'll tr try to be brief. I'll spend five more minutes explaining this. And, uh, and then some of it I will leave to those who are interested to read in the notes. Um, okay, so, so let's, uh, so let's uh, start uh, discussing the computation of, so I want to understand local symplectic homology of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, compact sets associated with polygons. So the first thing to say is let's consider a polygon which does not contain the singular uh, value. So it's a polygon here. And note that I've drawn it so that it intersects the monodromy invariant line. Like this, there's this special line. And actually this is important. Uh, uh, like we have to make a distinction between a polygon which intersects the monodromy invariant line and which one that does not. But first, okay, so uh, we will get to that in a minute. So to this polygon, we can associate somehow the completion of the polygon, which is just some kind of copy of R2, which is associated with canonically with this polygon. Uh, and then the claim is that there exists a symplectic embedding of somehow take the, the cotangent bundle of the torus, like take this R2 times the torus. Uh, um, so there exists like a, a, like this, um, the embedding of this polygon can be extended to an embedding of a complete embedding of the entire cotangent bundle into, uh, in, into this space M. And note, I've drawn this parabola. What this is saying is like that we can take this map, this embedding to be toric, uh, to, uh, around an arbitrary, on the complement of an arbitrarily small uh, neighborhood of, the, of this ray. But in the end, it has to become non-toric. Because if we have like, if we look at the toric pre-image of the complement of this ray, there are invariants, symplectic invariants, which distinguish the resulting manifold from, from the cotangent bundle of a torus. And there really is no such embedding. But somehow by allowing non-toric non embedding, there's like a complete embedding. And the fact that you have a complete embedding, I call this uh, iota, this complete embedding isolates the, 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 uh, the uh, isolates our set from M. Uh, this is some kind of work in progress. And, but actually I think in this case, it can be deduced from uh, like con convexity arguments maybe. Uh, so since this uh, is isolated, then somehow there is no contribution from FLIR, FLIR trajectories which go outside. Somehow the distance, this, this, uh, uh, this polygon symplectically, it doesn't know that it is embedded inside uh, a, a manifold with a nodal singularity. And so, so to say something more precise, we have to make a distinction. So let's talk about two, dis uh, two cases. So one case is when this polygon intersects the monodromy invariant line. In that case, there's a unique such embedding up to up to uh, isotopy. And then that means that there is some kind of canonical uh, uh, identification of the symplectic homology uh, of, the, of, the, of K as embedded, like of this KP embedded inside M with a symplectic homology of the same thing where it's embedded inside its own completion. And this, so there's a canonical isomorphism with somehow poly vector fields on the canonical sheaf. Uh, which we discussed about before. In the case where we have two, in the case where we have two different, uh, uh, sorry, in the case where we have something which is uh, off the monodromy invariant line, we can find two different such embeddings. So there's like this red one, and then there's the purple one. So we get two different isomorphisms, uh, and so two different, so they're not one canonical isomorphism, but two different isomorphisms with uh, the canonical sheaf. Uh, so, so what remains is to discuss the, uh, uh, the case where we have a singularity inside. So, so let's say we have a polygon which does contain the singular value. And here I will be very brief, even though this is the most important part. 
Um, so the, one, one can look at somehow the sheaf theoretic properties of this sheaf of local SH. Um, uh, and then it turns out, so, so look at this picture and ignore the fact that I've deleted a piece. So, so P is like this entire, uh, what looks like a triangle. And then the, the, the this this sheaf I've defined the sheaf. There's a sheaf here, like a, for every uh, p, there is like the symplectic homology of k p. Uh, so this sheaf has satisfies kind of a Hartog's property, which says that if you delete some piece inside, um, the symplectic the, at least the zero symplectic homology of the entire piece is the same as the zero symplectic homology of the piece after you delete it a little bit. So that's one property. And then another property is the sheaf property, which says that if you want to know what is the symplectic homology of this entire thing, you can break it down into a union of U1 and U2. And the sheaf property says that symplectic homology of this of the union is the same as uh, sections uh, for, uh, for each one of, the, of these uh, uh, polygons, uh, which agree on overlaps. By the way, you might object that this thing does not look like a convex polygon, but in fact it is because this integral affine structure here is broken. So, so basically what this means, this reduces, uh, um, this reduces uh, uh, the computation of, of what is the symplectic homology of this entire set. Redu it reduces to computing transition maps between, we, have, we said there are two identifications. So it reduces to, uh, to uh, computing tra uh, transition maps for these two uh, different uh, like there's these two different embeddings. There's two different, uh, it's written here, or no, it's not written here. So we have these two different embeddings, two different identifications of the symplectic homology of, 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 uh, of like these sets, these, inter these overlapping sets. We have for each one of them, we have two different identifications with the canonical sheaf. And what we need, at, at each, uh, and it, each of them comes from whether we think of it as a subset of this one or as a subset of this one. So uh, in light of the sheaf property here, all we need is to figure out what is this, what is the transition map? And then unfortunately, I will not go into details, but somehow the further axioms of this sheaf allow you to determine completely what is, what is the transition map. And, and so you can figure out what is the symplectic homology just by some soft sheaf theoretic properties. Uh, so, um, so, the, uh, so I think now is time for a break. And the actual computation I will not do after the break, but I think I will, the notes will be available. So anyone who wants to uh, read this um, is uh, welcome to. So, uh, so can I, so, so now is actually a time for uh, questions. Uh, I'm sorry for like taking this long. Um, okay, so questions, the more basic, the better on the record first, and then we'll pause the recording. So, so I think it's fair to say that this is isomorphic to the first part of my talk, but done in a completely different way. Okay. Um, is, is that an accurate uh, statement? Um, yes, I, I think like about this thing that like that there's this canonical, well, Except that, like the, here, you—it's not like you look for some way to make things compatible. Like the point, the, like the point that I'm trying to convey, is that you have, like, you are given an algebra, like this algebra here. Right. There's a, a given algebra, and you're figuring out what it is. Right. right. Uh, so that—that's somehow how I would say. But in the end, the answer has to be, uh, yeah, I believe somehow when you go down to the computation. Be. And, like, and maybe yeah, also like, there's a little bit more worry about the convergence in the rigid analytic sense. Of yeah, yeah, this, so, a little bit. Yes. Yeah. So this argument, maybe if you will read my notes, I don't know. I did like this argument. I've made it more complicated than it has to be, a little bit, uh, because having to do with this convergence stuff, like, uh, and the re my reason is that in the end, I think this store like. Like when you work in this particular case of uh, where you have just one nodal singularity, there are a lot of uh, simplifications. Mm -hmm. But once you embed this into a case where you have lots of nodal singularities, like there isn't just like two isomorphisms 
for, for a given overlapping set, there's like, there could be a million. Uh, and right. you can't somehow distinguish any one of them. So I think the argument here is somehow transfers. Once you, once you prove any kind of non-canonical local iso isomorphism statement with the canonical sheaf, the, uh, the rest of the argument, which is written in the notes, I think would transfer uh, mm -hmm. to a completely general setting. So, but, but that does require to pay attention a little bit to these infinite. Now, I think you said, so if you have a polygon not containing the singular point, but on the, the line, uh, yes. you said that's isomorphic. Uh, you don't actually see the line. Is, is that correct? Uh, again, what? Sorry, I don't see the uh, line. So, so I think you said a bit earlier that when you have a, um, when you take a polygon that's actually has that, that uh, the monodromy invariant line passing through it. Yes. Right. That the symplectic homology, the relative symplectic homology in that uh, for that polygon, doesn't see the fact that that line is passing through it. There are no uh, flow trajectories leaving. Ah, it it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't see. So yeah, it's a figure. Yes, it doesn't see. Um, well, in in a way, I, I don't know what when you say when something doesn't see that. That's also a question. Well, well I, I'm I'm trying to repeat what you said, but I might be yeah, repeating yeah, it yeah. correctly. Oh, I'm saying I said something which is a little bit figurative. But I mean, ma maybe a simpler way of saying it is in the picture that's currently on the screen, the two halves, the left side of P and the right side um, in purple, don't actually know that they live near a singularity. And they are, the blue and the purple one are just the same thing in terms of intrinsic symplectic geometry. Yeah. And is that a feature of this particular example, or would you expect this to be true more generally? That um, okay. Suppose so you have that, a huge number of okay. So, there is, so the, uh, maybe I, uh, that would be like getting a bit, a bit ahead of myself. But basically, I think in so there's two types of examples. So there's examples which I think overlap or maybe coincide with these local lab yao, uh, or some chunk of these. Uh, maybe I'll get there. So where you, you have this kind of thing where you have a complete embedding. So whenever you have a complete embedding. There is this kind of thing that you get something which is isolated from the from the surrounding. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, if you have a K3 surface, you don't have complete embeddings. So, but still there is some kind of locality statement. So I, um, yeah. So I don't know if it would be appropriate to say um, that it doesn't know. Like it's maybe it's kind of a philosophical. Can I add something to this doesn't see uh, thing? Because I think it's too vague to actually mean something. Okay. So it doesn't see when you choose the right almost complex structure. There's an almost complex structure that you can put in this space, which kind of looks like the almost complex structure on some uh, actual T star T2. In larger and larger, so there's not one almost complex structure, but there's some sequence of almost complex structures, which kind of look more and more like it's sitting in larger and larger uh, compact sets inside T star T2. And you extend this uh, almost complex structure to the entire space, but from the eyes of this uh, relative or local symplectic cohomology, which involves this completion procedure, that somehow that makes it kind of invisible, like this kind of truncating the energy levels makes it so that like if, for example, let's say we've actually fixed an energy level and truncated with that energy level, then we could take a large enough compact set and then this would actually cut off all communication between that small compact set we had and the, the rest of the, the manifold mm -hmm. up to having things that, that has larger than energy. E, which disappear right. after the any other trajectories yeah. would be be big. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think comparison with uh, your work uh, is that we, we kind of we have a lot more flexibility in which almost complex structures we're using. So I think a, a lot less scattering is happening for this kind of almost complex structures. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually asking the question for a specific purpose, which is I I need some statement like that. Some isomorphism <laughs> statement for some work I'm doing. Anyways, mm -hmm. I'm quite curious whether uh, there's something something I can learn from that. Okay. It would be good, good to communicate after the talk, maybe. Um, if, if yeah, sure. Okay. Any other questions? 
Chris, you look like you're about to speak. Well, can, can you say so just something quickly about geometric properties of the mirror from this point of view? I mean, uh, you know, from this construction, it's not clear whether, you know, you'll, you'll get something smooth or log collabial or I don't know. Okay, yes. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, so uh, well, if you just start out and you say nothing, then, then you, uh, like you have to, so, so when you say the mirror, you have to talk about local models. Uh, and so at least if you have local models and the mirror will also have, uh, so, so for example, the local model, if you carry out the computation, so, so, so say you're, uh, let's talk in this example. So if you look at a polygon, which is away from the singularity, then the mirror looks like a, a non archimedean torus vibration. If you look in the neighborhood of the singularity, the mirror looks like uh, the mirror, some, no, some, there's a formula, there's an answer, and it's, uh, it's like the non-Archimedean nodal vibration. Um, and all, these things overlap in, in, in Tori, so they glue together. Uh, uh, so, so if you have nodal singularities, then the mirror will be some smooth, uh, uh, like a, a rigid analytic space, or a, depending on your construction, either a rigid analytic space or a, a Berkovic space. And if these models are indeed nodal singularities, it will be uh, um, uh, will be some kind of smooth Calabiao, uh, smooth space will be Calabiao. Um, uh, and I th at the end of the talk, there will also be some kind of relation between somehow Diram cohomology and on the, on, on the mirror and uh, quantum cohomology in the space you started with, which was some point that I was trying to make. Um, does that satisfy? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was wondering for, for more complicated singularities, is it clear okay. that you'll get some, I mean, or, or is, it, is it always, you know, like, is there an abstract reason you always get something that's collabial, for example, regardless of which singularity you start with? Yes, yes, yes. The abstract reason you always get something collabial is that you have, uh, like, maybe, I don't know if the collabial necessarily extends across the singularity, right? Mm -hmm. You get, we get some, some collabial because it is given in terms of fleur theory, the collabial structure comes from a map mm -hmm. of ordinary cohomology to, uh, to uh, uh, local fleur cohomology. Mm -hmm. If you talk about singularities, like if you give me the list of singularities, like the gross Hebert singularities, then yes, I think the answer is that they're all by similar methods. They all, uh, uh, you compute at least, and you find that they give you, they have smooth mirrors. But if you just say arbitrary disparity, I don't know if it's, it hasn't been explored. Like, so mm -hmm. uh, an abstract reason, I cannot say. Like maybe there is, I'm not, like, it just hasn't been thought about enough. Uh, Wait, so I, I thought about this <laughs> quite a bit, so I can actually talk if you're interested uh, after, after the talk. There are some general reasons. I, I can't say what I think are the general reasons, but it involves, like I think the most serious a, part is, huh? Sorry, maybe a vision. Like no, no, not no, arbitrary. Just ask you like, not arbitrary. It can't oh, be okay. arbitrary, but there is like a, there are some characteristics of models which will give res, give rise to. So the the most crucial of the properties is that this should actually result in a rigid analytic space. Mm -hmm. So like it should be actually all of these uh, algebras should be affinoid algebras with the restriction maps being in the right uh, category and stuff. I can give you some general uh, characteristics of what will result in that as far as I understand after this talk is over here. Yeah, I'm assuming that it has, like, it has a lot to do, but in the end, the kind of input that this thing needs is on the one hand, understanding monodromy around the singularities and kind of also, but you also need something to know, know something about the Hamiltonian flow on the boundary. But yeah, I don't have anything more, but maybe almost has, uh, yeah. So, okay. Okay. Maybe we should return to the talk now, if that's okay. And um, there can be more questions at the end of the talk. So, okay, so now, so, so yeah, so I've made a big point of this thing that the mirror can be constructed 
by somehow gluing together pieces which come from closed where in Hamilton and Fleurimology, but then one wonders uh, how is this related, like there are, there are existing constructions which come from disk bubbling uh, and everybody's familiar with the newspaper. Uh, so the question is how are these two things uh, related? Um, so uh, so th this is some kind of idea which uh, uh, like the philosophy of this is in a paper that I have written and I think as far as it has been like completely ignored. So uh, I want to also use the opportunity to kind of advertise. Uh, I think it's an, it does have some interesting ideas. Um, so, okay, so let's revisit this, uh, this example. So we said we have like two points of view uh, on, um, um, uh, like on this, uh, like there's a leftist vibration point of view uh, and there is this uh, torus vibration point of view. Uh, so from the leftist point, vibration point of view, you have, uh, so you have, you, you, you have a map, a conic vibration. So you have a map, which is a, a geolomorphic map from the total space uh, down to C star. And then when you go to the torus vibration point of view, you see this, like it projects to some line in the base. And this line, I intentionally draw it as a curved line because there's nothing, it ha there's reason for it to be straight in any way I find sense. Uh, and this line is, uh, is any Lagrangian which uh, bounds, any fiber which bounds the torus must project to this, uh, to this line. Uh, now, when you have a left sheet vibration, maybe near the singularity, you care about what the precise model, but away from the singularity, this is completely flexible. So you can, you can take this wall and you can bend it whichever way you want, as long as it doesn't become parallel to any of these lines. So, so, so say, consider you have this uh, polygon uh, inside your, uh, your um, in, in the base of the vibration, then you can, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, think about how this uh, polygon stands in relation to the wall. And you can have like, and the wall could be, so now we're going to consider specifically uh, polygons which are not on the monodromy invariant line and such polygons you can uh, you can have you can somehow change the almost complex structure j uh, so you can start with an almost complex structure j with, such that the polygon is on one side of the line and then you by changing it you slide the wall across the the uh, polygon uh, now, now now this thing we can relate this to disk bubbling as follows so let's say we have a point which, which, which lives inside our polygon. And we're looking at the, the Lagrangian fluoromology of this point, which lives in the fiber. So because we have these uh, two, uh, because we have these two sides of the wall, like the, the, the point can also live on either side of the wall. And for each side, we have a version of Lagrangian fl intersection fluoromology. Uh, so I call this uh, HF star plus and HF star minus. So these are just two different things which are isomorphic, but in a non-canonical way. And a different way of saying this is that you choose a bounding co-chain. So there's a different way, like this is just some kind of, uh, instead of talking about bounding co-chains, I'm just saying that there are two different non-isomorphic versions. And so that's the open string story. And that's something called the closed open map. So the closed open map is, if, if you look at zeroth uh, symplectic homology, the, lo uh, the local version, in that paper, I was talking about uh, global symplectic homology, which is like Viterbo, so some different version, but it's very closely related and it works for local symplectic homology. So uh, there's a map which goes from, from, from the global symplectic homology, sorry, from the local symplectic homology to the fluoromology of fibers inside. Uh, and there are two maps uh, for the two versions. Uh, of the uh, of fluoromology, and they come about by counting for each for a fiber. We just uh, look at uh, disks. We have a boundary puncture. Uh, so the disk, the boundaries on the Lagrangian, and then there's a puncture, which is a, co a cord, which can be thought of as generator of the intersection fluoromology. And there's an interior puncture, which corresponds to the periodic orbit, and that comes from the uh, from the closed string part. Uh, just formally, because you have such a thing, uh, you get a map which goes from the zero symplectic homology to this canonical sheaf that uh, I described before. So a priori, 
I should say what you get is not a map to here. You get, just get some function. Like you, you think of the polygon as point, the points of the polygon parameterize Lagrangians. And so for each Lagrangian, you get an element of the Novikov ring, where the element of the Novikov ring is just the coefficient of the unit of the Lagrangian section fluoromology under the map, from, under the closed open map. Like the, the, this just goes to a pro, the unit times something, and that so so you get some uh, uh, you get an element of the Novikov ring because our thing like every time you have such a thing you you assign to it a weight which comes from the uh, area from the symplectic area. So a priori this is like a set function, but when you think about it, you apply some basic uh, uh, compactness and transversality properties for uh, Fleur theory. You, you deduce that this set function is actually given by some kind of analytic function. So it's actually like a, su a convergent sum of, of monomials. You get a map, you, you get two maps for the two versions of the homology from, uh, uh, from the symplectic homology to uh, functions. To, uh, and, and also, like we, we said before that when you have this polygon, you have like different maps there are different locality isomorphisms. So, so, so basically we had a pair of maps before from SH0 to, to the canonical sheaf. And I've added two more, but they actually, they match somehow. Uh, the lo one locality map corresponds to one of these maps to, to functions. And basically the idea is that this thing, this process where you isolate your set also isolates somehow the FLIR trajectories appearing in this closed open uh, slope. Now let, let's, Consider what happens uh, when you have somehow you have some uh, uh, homotopy, where you where you have some uh, uh, you, say you have some uh, almost complex structure, and let's say it just uh, the wall just goes somewhere through your polygon, and now you an you want to analyze how this closed open map behaves. So so let's say the the you have a periodic orbit which corresponds to some covector here. And then you evaluate it. You want to evaluate the corresponding function on some Lagrangian. So, well, if we take something which is on this side of the wall, we get, we get a certain solution. But now, if we go across the wall, so what happens is when we hit the wall, uh, we get some disk which gets glued to the open closed trajectory. And that, that adds an additional term. So, so basically, whenever we, 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 don't con we look at J, which does not lie on one side of the polygon, but goes through the polygon um, we don't have what we get is a map what we get is some kind of map from the uh, open uh, so from local symplectic homology to certain functions which have a a jump discontinuity uh, as you as you uh, move across now when you think of this what this is saying is that when you apply some kind of uh, uh, this can be uh, take uh, like you think a little, a little bit more about this, you will see that if you take this homotopy where uh, you, you have a homotopy where you have this almost complex structure which is changing, then uh, first of all, this by just general nonsense, Fleur theory nonsense, this induces a map of symplectic homology to itself. And basically when this, when this, uh, when you get, when you, you, you uh, slide, when you do this uh, wall sliding homotopy, what happens is that uh, that the induced continuation map is basically the uh, wall crossing transformation. In other words, like the, you get somehow when when you do this wall sliding homotopy uh, and you apply a continuation map, you get some kind of additional non-trivial continuation trajectories going from uh, from from certain uh, closed periodic orbits to certain other closed periodic orbits. So, so this basically means that wall crossing is visible in uh, the closed string setting. Uh, it has at least a shadow in the closed string setting, which comes from basically taking continuation maps where you vary uh, the almost complex structure. Uh, but actually, so I think this is kind of the, the explanation why, at least this was my motivation initially for what, for thinking that we could do the entire, uh, like, Reconstruction, for example, could be done using just purely closed strings. It was because of this phenomenon, but actually, I, I think it's a little bit mysterious. Like, what so, somehow? Why does wall crossing 
produce some kind of non-trivial uh, continuation trajectories. So that, that's a question. And actually, when I, I spoke with Mohammed about this a while ago, he said that the gross Siebert people, they also have something about wall crossing having to do with cylinders. So that maybe that's somehow related. So if anyone has a comment about that, I'd be happy to hear. Uh, somehow tropical cylinders in, uh, as a replacement of disks. Is there such an idea or maybe I... Um, yeah, I, I assume that he was uh, thinking of the broken lines, which I think I alluded to very briefly, but didn't uh, make mm -hmm. the point mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. okay, anyhow, so that's just some kind of explanation. So now, um, yeah, so, so, okay, so the last part of the talk, I want to first, I want to say a little bit somehow to, uh, um, I, I'm saying that one, one, one can do like mirror symmetry within like classical mirror symmetry by just following the, uh, just applying closed strings. So I want to formulate a slight refinement of the SYZ mirror symmetry conjecture. So, but if you want to formulate, uh, if, uh, so first we need a definition of what is an SYZ fibration. And uh, I don't know what is a good definition. Uh, so one definition, which uh, people use is, well, you take, you have a Lagrangian torus vibration, uh, somehow, which is Calabi Yau, and it has mass of zero fibers, and somehow you have a co-dimension two uh, discriminant locus, and then you have some assumption on the singularities, that they are gross Hebert type. Uh, now, this works fine, this is fine for dimension two, but once you go to a higher dimension, this is a bit too restrictive. For example, I think it's not expected to hold for the quintic threefold. So, um, so this definitely needs to be weakened. And I think this approach of local symplectic homology allows for numerous ways of weakening, but it's not, it's not really clear what, in what way this should be weakened. So I can't make a statement, but I will have, I think I have some remarks uh, towards the end. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, Sorry, uh, Denis, I can't hear you. Sorry, about seven or eight minutes. Oh, seven or eight minutes. Okay, so let me just briefly form the conjecture and then, uh, so yeah, so the conjecture is, so let's say we start with an SYZ fibration. Then to this SYZ fibration, no matter what you, uh, 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 without any assumptions on, on uh, sorry, we've made assumptions, so forget it. So with, to this SYZ fibration, um, there's associated a sheaf, uh, SH0. And once you have a sheaf, you can uh, associate, you can talk about some kind of Gelfand spectrum of the sheaf, which is basically, sorry, Gelfand spectrum of, you have a sheaf of algebras, that's the point. You have a sheaf of commutative Banach algebras. And to such a thing, you can associate uh, a Gelfand spectrum. So uh, that produces a space, which a priori we know nothing about. And the conjecture is that, first of all, there exists a, a continuous map from this uh, space, M check, to the base. And, uh, and this actually, I think, maybe just from the definition, there exists such a continuous function. So it doesn't need to be part of the conjecture, but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm stating it this way. Um, and then the conjecture is that under suitable hypotheses, such as those that I listed, uh, but which definitely they can be weakened in various ways. Uh, this space uh, is uh, Calabi-Yau, uh, and the the function is a non-Archimedean SYZ fibration, meaning that locally it's modeled on this valuation function that we talked about before, away from the discriminant locus. Uh, then, uh, uh, if you take you take that space and you push forward the polyvector fields, you recover the if uh, symplectic homology. And, and of course, I have to say that zero symplectic homology is a sheaf automatically. Uh, higher symplectic homology also, in, in, uh, it's actually, it also includes all kinds of terms which come from check homology. So I should say the sheafification somehow of higher symplectic homologies. Or another, another way of saying it is that we take sufficiently small polygons, and then it's uh, it's just this sheaf of isosymplectic homology, and then there's a BV operator, which uh, so 
which is just defined. We said that we have these uh, BV, uh, these, these are all BV algebras. So the claim is that this BV algebra is, uh, is dual to the exterior derivative under the Calabial form. So this is somehow what the, the, the conjecture about what this uh, uh, sheaf produces. And then there are additional conjectures about what kind of mirror symmetry this satisfies. So if, if you, I, I'm not sure this is necessary, but if you additionally assume that omega is rational, so the projective variety, uh, then M and M check are a Hodge theoretic mirror pair. And this maybe requires working, somehow I started out working with the universal Novi covering, but if you say, you say that omega is rational, you can actually work over formal, formal Laurent series. Uh, and that maybe is important for this. And then if, if somehow, if the Lagrangian vibration ad admits a Lagrangian section, which is fixed under an anti-symplectic involution, then these two spaces are also a homological mirror pair. And maybe I should say, when I say that they are a homological mirror pair, actually, it's not just that there is some, there exists some equivalence. Actually, the Fleur theory, the same ideas, Fleur theory, the same method of local Fleur theory actually produces some functor, some, uh, some obvious functor. And then the claim is that that particular functor induces an equivalence. So uh, this is the conjecture. Uh, now, um, let me say a few words. Uh, so like this conjecture is kind of a refinement, like it gives you some kind of definite uh, construction. And the claim is that this, like the construction makes sense. So, so we start with something which some definite object, and then we make claims about that object. Uh, and now, how do we prove claim, such claims? So there are two things to address. So first, there's this, the subject of regular, so, so regular fibers. Uh, so that has to do, so there's this thing, that, the question of locality, uh, which I think I don't have much time to get into, but it's akin to uh, what we were talking before, like is if you look at the local Fleur theory of a neighborhood of the of the of the of, of a, a torus fiber, when is it the case that uh, the Fleur theory is not deformed? Uh, and this this is kind of a question which is it's somehow if you have the, the for example if you know if you work with the Grange intersection Fleur homology, there's a, there's a notion of unobstructedness. So unobstructedness, if you followed the argument that I gave before. You should see, well, maybe this needs a little more, but that unobstructedness, for example, implies locality. Where no, locality just means that there exists a non-canonical isomorphism uh, of the symplectic homology uh, of, the, of this local polygon with, um, with uh, the canonical sheaf. So a, a highly non-canonical isomorphism, but an isomorphism nevertheless. So, so that's somehow the treatment of the general fiber of the of the generic fibers, and then the treatment of the singular fibers. That that's basically the kind of reasoning that we were talking before about um, Hartog's properties and sheaf properties. Um, so, so there are we have a number of partial results, but I don't want to say. But uh, so I think what I do want to say is. Um, okay, so let me make a few remarks before I conclude. So I think um, as far, if we really make these assumptions of SYZ, uh, um, like strict SYZ vibration, we have, uh, so there's still work to do, but it's not far from actually like proving, like we have some cases where we can actually prove. And I think a quite general you can prove the, uh, the first part of the conjecture, which was that you get some kind of nice space, which has some kind of nice relation, uh, nice relations, but before getting to Hodge theoretic mirror symmetry. Now, if we want to weaken, I think I just want to point out, make a remark uh, that somehow, uh, if we want to weaken the assumptions of what is an, S, what is an SYZ vibration, so one weakening is we, we, the, uh, Yang gave a, gave a talk this week and he talked about uh, uh, torus vibrations of uh, somehow when you have Lagrangian torus vibrations, 
uh, that somehow under some uh, conjecture, it is expected that you have uh, uh, you have a Lagrangian torus vibration on the complement of some set which has Hausdorff dimension one plus epsilon. Uh, sorry, which is zero in Hausdorff dimension one plus epsilon. They think that's actually sufficient for proving locality. So for proving the existence of a non-canonical isomorphism for a generic fiber uh, to to the uh, um, to the canonical sheaf, or which is another way of saying proving unobstructedness, that is quite sufficient. But if we don't have any kind of idea about the shape of the discriminant locus, then it's pretty hard. I don't know. Like it's pretty hard to say anything. Um, on the other hand, there's another weakening, which is uh, so. There's this paper by Matessi and Castano Bernard, where they construct for the quintic threefold uh, a piecewise smooth vibration, and then uh, the the discriminant locus is not co-dimension two, but its shape is kind of co-dimension two, and basically it's like it's like a piecewise smooth vibration, but somehow the bad points are concentrated in small balls around the singularity. So that's actually quite sufficient. Like once you make that assumption, since we only care about what uh, somehow, we more care mostly about the boundary of, of the region and we have some kind of Hartux property. So for treating singularities, that's a good weakening. But on the other hand, maybe that's kind of a problem for, for, the, um, for the locality slash unobstructedness point of view. So, so I, I guess I need to finish. Let me just finish by just this last, I, I said something about, I gave a challenge at the beginning of the talk, like how you relate uh, if you have, uh, if you construct a mirror, then how do you relate, uh, how do you uh, relate it, like the topological test of mirror symmetry, why, why would you expect it to, uh, to hold? So, so, and I think this is somehow the basis for the relation which I believe exists between the, hot, the closed string mirror and Hodge theoretic uh, mirror symmetry. So uh, if you take Omut's thesis, uh, maybe I should have written uh, a link, but whatever. So, uh, so Omut has a paper named, I think, the Meyer-Vettori sequence. So, and you add a little bit of additional input, then, um, then you have this, in, this equation, which says that if you take the, the kth quantum cohomology is obtained by taking the uh, pth uh, uh, like taking the direct sum over check cohomologies of this uh, symplectic uh, cohomology sheaf. Uh, okay, and then by mirror symmetry, uh, the part one of the conjecture, which I said, uh, this is the same as taking uh, check cohomologies of certain uh, polyvector fields, um, which is to say, well, you start over B, but somehow these things are acyclic, so it's the same as looking at check cohomologies of polyvector fields which is the same by Calabial property as check homology of uh, differential forms. And this is basically kind of a weak version of the topological test of mirror symmetry. So I hope this convinces, for me, it's convincing that actually like pushing this further, this can also, this will, would also lead to an actual proof of Hodge theoretic mirror symmetry. So I, I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments? Uh, there's this recent work of uh, Jonathan Evans and Mirko Mari constructing Lagrangian vibrations. Would those be useful? I, I, yeah, I, I've seen these papers. I haven't yet read them carefully, but I definitely, I think I would look at them and probably they, I, I would expect that they at least relevant, they're at least relevant, hopefully. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they get co-dimension to discriminant locus, but I'm not quite sure what the status of description of the, the singular fibers is. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. The point like, is there's a loss of smoothness at the discriminant, right? Uh, absolutely, but the, you know, that's already the case in the um, uh, Metesi, uh, Castagno, Bernard. Yeah, yeah, because somehow this, yeah, the question is not like you're allowed to have, this is like, this is part of the point that I wanted to sell about this, this local approach that since you're not focused on points, you're focused on neighborhoods, so if you have some kind of domain and inside you have the vibration comes on smooth, that's not a big deal. So, yeah, so yeah. if somebody says non-smooth, I need to see like uh, what kind of non-smooth. Because if uh, near the boundary, it's no longer non-smooth as in Matessi and, and uh, Castano Bernard, then that's absolutely fine. 
Yeah, and one other question about your conjecture: you uh, you had the homological mirror symmetry if there's a um, a section which is the fixed locus of anti symplectic evolution. Is that to avoid the kind of a situation I think Mohammed considers where you might need to have a uh, a, a Jeremy derived category on the other side? Okay. Thanks. Is the is the Fabinius manifold as simple as sticking in a uh, an, a, a bulk deformation, or is it is it more complicated than that? I don't know. And uh, it's just like I'm ignorant about this. Not uh, mm. I mean that. Sorry, I'm still thinking of Chris's question, and I think. To get the Frobenius manifold structure, first you need to unwind the isomorphism that makes the parameter space for bulk deformations the same as this particular vision of quantum cohomology. Uh, right, that's what I was wondering is, you know, what, what, what do you need to... Well, so I think that means you need to make the bulk insertions be things that live in this like cohomology of the sheaf SHQ. Right, so yeah, but, but that, that was my question is what, what, what do those objects look like? I mean... Uh, do you need to somehow make the cycle sort of behave well with respect to the decomposition that you're using or? I, don't, I, I, I guess, know. I mean, yeah, you could just choose a co-cycle representing, I mean, no, a check co-cycle for your cover of B representing if you want, and that, that should work. Hey, that's a good, that's a good suggestion. You will, you should look into this. Okay, yeah, I will. I there's a lot to, I, yeah, like it's been years that we're thinking about it, but we haven't yet got to all, like to everything that there is to uh, uh, explore here. So like this Hodge theoretic mirror symmetry is on the, on the table for a year now, but you know, we haven't got beyond, like we've got a little bit beyond thinking about this, the basic, so, or. As if he that. doesn't have enough to do. I mean, maybe I should just make a comment on the, the Hodge theoretic mirror symmetry. Of course we know so even from Batarev's construction that the mirror need not always be non-singular and you might have to use something other than the traditional Hodge theory, such as stringing Hodge numbers to get, um, get the equality. I, I suppose that might come in to um, sort of a hypothesis on what the Lagrangian vibration looks like. Mm -hmm. Like what? Uh, because think I think we, we, we have examples or what we expect kind of should be of, like, of torus vibration. That when you dualize, you get singularities. Sorry, do you think that has to do with like having other kinds of singularities which are not of this type? Uh, yeah, that would be my guess. Well, so in the, I mean, this is something that, that never really got developed, um, but in sort of the original Gross-Siebert program, um, we had you know, classes of kinds of singularities of the affine structure that, that we could allow. Mm -hmm. And somewhere I have a couple of pages that build local models for the torus vibrations over those. Mm -hmm. um, and the things those are, you know, they might be singular. Mm -hmm. the, the total spaces of those vibrations might be singular. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, uh, it's not quite, well, I'm not sure how one would, would define the, the stringing cohomology in that case, uh, in this kind of setting. So, I mean, my is guess is you'd have to place some restriction. Sorry? Is that a paper which is, which is somewhere, like, or is it not? Uh, um, I, I can see if there's anything on my computer that's of yeah, value. I would, I'd be very interested in listening, like studying, exa like, yeah. I think we need examples just to study what local SH yeah. like and like more, more examples. So, uh, yeah. But I think how good how Rudout is the person who's thought about these things most recently, mm -hmm. uh, these sort of topological points of view. Okay, if there's no further questions for the record, maybe we should just save ourselves a few minutes of break time. At least I will stop the recording now. Let's thank Yoel again. And...